My name is Susie Pappas and today is June 27th, 2019. I'm interviewing Linda Klein at the Max M. Fisher Federation Building in Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. This interview is being recorded as part of the Women in Leadership Oral History Project. Do you give the permission to the Leonard N. Simons Jewish Community Archives to publish, duplicate, or otherwise use this recording for educational purposes and for use as deemed appropriate by the archives? Yes. The Women's Philanthropy Department has been known by several names throughout its history, but for the purpose of this interview, the questions will refer to it by its current name, Women's Philanthropy, but you may use whatever name you're comfortable with when discussing it. Linda, when and where were you born? I was born in Detroit at Women's Hospital uh, on January the 8th, 1940. That's it. I was born. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Like everybody else. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay. So um, where did your family live when you were born and where did you go to school? Okay. Um, and how long did you actually stay in, in Detroit? Okay, so I've always been in Detroit. Mm -hmm. And my schooling situation is kind of interesting because my parents were young, a young couple with literally nothing. And we lived, I went to seven different schools before I got to college. So the little house I was born in was on the street called Eileen, a little teeny weeny adorable little house. And then my father, who went into the peanut butter business, and as he got more and more successful and worked harder, he obviously wanted a little bigger house. So then we lived on uh, Wisconsin. I think we were on the corner of Pickford and Wisconsin. We only lived, he built the house from stem to stern. And then a few, just a few years later, when I was seven, we moved to Warrington Drive which was in those days in Sherwood Forest near Livernois and Seven Mile Road. And then eventually, when I was almost in college, they moved out to Fairway Hills Drive, which was on the golf course of Franklin Hills. So in that, with all those moves, I started at Fitzgerald School, went to kindergarten. Then I went to, then when we moved to Wisconsin, I went to Bagley School. Then when we moved to Warrington Drive, I went to Hampton School. And then Hampton School changed the district lines. Uh, so I was, and I loved Hampton School, it broke my heart. And I was supposed to go to pastor school, which I would have loved to do, but my parents had other ideas. So in the sixth grade, which was not a good choice, I went to Brookside School out in Bloomfield Hills. So I got up at six in the morning, got on a bus with a whole bunch of strange kids in the sixth grade and went to Brookside School. And then I went on to Kingswood for two years, seventh and eighth grade, and then I begged my parents to let me go to Mumford High, and I was so sure they weren't going to, but they did. So I went to Mumford High for four years. That was the happiest days, I loved it. And I then went to University of Michigan, where I met my husband. Very nice. I just have to say, I've known Linda for a long time, but did not know right. that. That's very and, and the one consistency in my life was Camp Tamaqua where I met Doreen and Reggie and a lot of people. And I went to Camp Tamaqua from the age of 10 to 18. So that was my one consistency. Interesting. So um, when you were growing up, how was religion observed in your household? We were extremely reform. My father had joined Temple Israel because he was a, a Zionist. And uh, Rabbi Fromm had left Temple Bethel to go to Temple Israel. Uh, so from the time we lived on Eileen, we went to Temple Israel. He might, and we, when I was a little girl, we went to services at the Detroit Institute of Arts. They didn't even have the, the first temple. We were very, very, very reform. I don't think I ever had a Shabbat dinner in my life did growing ever, up. Did you have a Christmas tree? Uh, sometimes we had a little Christmas tree that my dad would bring home from the office. Mm -hmm. And one famous family story was that we had a real Christmas tree on Wisconsin one year, and Erwin Cohn came over to bring bagels, lox, and cream cheese on Sunday. And my father, who was pretty tough, 
almost fainted dead away, ran to the door and tried to block the door. So I don't think we ever had one. But yes, my parents had Christmas trees from time to time. Yeah. So um, did, you ha did you have siblings? I had a brother, Norb, uh, Norbert Zuckerman, and um, unfortunately he died at the age of 66. So was your brother bar mitzvahed? My brother was bar mitzvahed. I was not bat mitzvah, we didn't have that, but I was confirmed and had the little open house beautiful confirmation party, yeah. So, um, did, you reserve, did you observe the, the Jewish holidays, do you remember? Yes, yes we did. And my grandmother, my both grand, my wife, particularly Grandma Fleischer, my mother's mother was religious. Mm -hmm. And she was my favorite anyway. And so we observed, um, you know, Passover, Mm -hmm. Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, you know, um, the majors. Yeah. Um, but as a family, but we were very community-minded right from the start. Well, that goes to my next yeah. question. Um, how, how was, um, was philanthropy important to your family, and how, how so? Okay, the first, men, the first real memories I have of my dad was he had a green Oldsmobile that used to be parked outside of our little house on Eileen, and every... Sat Sunday morning, it must have been, he went to meetings for Israel. He was a passionate about Israel from the time he was the very youngest man. And so we belonged to Temple Israel, which was the Zionist one at the time. And um, so I was always very, very aware of, of Israel. And I remember sitting in Temple the day the state was announced, or shortly thereafter in Sunday school. And I remember that was important to me because it had always been important to my dad. Right. Mother. Um, did your mother do anything charitable wise when you were growing up? When I was growing up, not so much. My father was very powerful, very demanding. She was the typical, but she was always smart and a big influence on my brother and I as far as our morals and our, and our values, but not so much. After my dad died, she really came into her own and she was pretty active. So when you were uh, growing up, in an, as well, were you involved in any uh, teenage Jewish organizations? I wasn't. You weren't. Mm -mm. And what about when you went to college at all? Um, not very much. I, I met a boyfriend at the Hillel Mixer okay. <laughs> first night of college, but not so much. I was in a Jewish sorority. Um, so, and at Camp Tamaqua, I, got a, I think I learned everything about my Judaism at Camp Tamaqua. Yeah. Okay. So, um, were you involved in other organizations besides Federation before you became involved at Federation? Okay. Because of my family, yes. when Tom and I moved, we lived in Toledo for about two years, a year or two years. The minute we moved back to Detroit, we became involved in Federation because, again, of my dad and my mother. And we got involved in the junior division, it was called in those days. And um, no, I wasn't. I was involved, uh, not as much as I should have been, but I was involved in my kids' schools and PTA and things like that. But, but you also worked. So not talk then, though. Okay. Not then, okay. no. Well, but, I worked in Toledo, just worked. But in Detroit, I didn't work. But you went back. So, yeah, so what happened was I was involved in junior division, and your husband was president. And he was president, and he won Tom. the Bowski Award, whatever it was. No, and mm -hmm. I wasn't all that involved, but okay. I was involved. And then he went on the cabinet. Tom went on the cabinet. But then I wasn't all that involved in women's division. At the time, it was called women's division, because I went back to law school. And so I really wasn't a factor very much in women's division. And then while I was in law school, which was when I was like 35, so like 1975, 76, 77, they were starting a new group. And I think we called it women's, working women. I think that's what it was called. Now, it wasn't professional women yet, working women. And they asked me, because I was going to law school, and there weren't that many working women, if I would become involved. And I said, sure. So I, and it was at night, the meetings. So that's how I got involved, and I became the chair eventually of Working Women or whatever it was called. And that was my real entrance to the women's side of Federation. Okay, so 
who are the leaders that you remember working with when you first became involved in women's division? Yeah, so after I graduated from law school and was practicing law in my fashion, um, I kind of got involved in women's division. It was still women's division. And in those days, I, I was trying to think of that. So the older, older ones in those days, I mean, there were so many. If we looked at the list of presidents, they would all be there. But there was Tilly Brandwine. I mean, I went back with um, Edith Jack here. Those were the, and, and, and I always loved Joe Weiner because she was, I don't think she ever became president, but she was just a force to be reckoned with. And she appealed to me because I like to write songs and skits and stuff like that. And then there was Ruthie Broder and Dulcie Rosenfeld. Jane was already involved. She was our age, Carolyn. but she was already involved. Carolyn Greenberg, Shelby Tauber mm -hmm. was involved. Mm -hmm. um, just a lot of a lot of women, and um, so those were the first ones. Now later on, my mentors, you know, were Penny, Diane Klein, um, those those women. So it, it it all it all evolved to where. Most of my best girlfriends became the women that were involved in Federation at that point. So, um, so you did this working women's um, group, right? And then you were also working. And then, um, how did you like? Yeah. Tell um, me about when they asked you to become campaign yeah, chair. Yeah, I think I sort of came out of nowhere because I really wasn't around that much. I. I must have taken a an officership, a chairmanship of either education or whatever, campaign or whatever, and I, I don't remember. I just, I just always remember they always asked me. I was never out looking, but I, they asked me and I was always happy. So I couldn't even tell you the year well, that I was campaign chair, but I'm so sure I were did. Were you surprised when you were asked to be campaign chair? I, I doubt it because I think I must have been chair of Ruby of Lion okay. Division. And so Ruby you were Lion president Division. in 19, 1995. So okay. that means that in 1992 they asked you to be the associate campaign chair, and then in '93 you were the '93 right. and '94. Okay, and before that, I was definitely for yes. sure uh, yes. chairman of. Uh, the Lion. I'm not sure I was giving Ruby at that time. Well, I don't think we time. had Ruby at that okay, time. Okay, so I was the chair of the Lion. Right. And I remember that I was the chair of the Lion because I was chairing the Lion luncheon. It was a lesson I never forgot. Yeah. I wrote a really good speech. Yes. It was too good. And? It was too long. I I hogged what the person, excuse the expression, but I... That's okay. <laughs> it was too long, too much, and I kind of... It, it, oh, the speaker, whoever was the speaker, I said too much, and I learned a very, very wise lesson there, which is when you're the, when you you just you 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 speak about what's appropriate for you to speak about. You don't have to be the the, the star of the afternoon, especially when that's not your job. And I okay, learned that learned in a that. very painful way. Well, I want to ask you yeah. before we go into talking more about yeah. your time as campaign chair and president. What did your your kids and your family think about your activities? Were they? Tom was always very supportive. Mm -hmm. My kids, I don't think, were all that much aware of it. I don't think, I really don't. I mean, they knew what I was doing, but I don't think I talked about it all that much. Um, well, when they were living at home, you probably weren't as involved, although John. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't an early one involved. So, I mean, I graduated from law school in 70, 80, mm -hmm. and then I worked, and then I was doing some federation stuff. I think they were more more concerned and annoyed about the law school thing. Okay. They, they never were. Okay. That was secondary to that. Um, and when they asked me, I'm trying to remember, I... I I don't think I was surprised at that stage of the game. I'd been working pretty hard. I was also, I think, involved in JVS at that time. So um, I don't think I was surprised, but I, I was thrilled. Let's put it that way. I was so ready JBS, to do JVS, I know you were president of JVS. And um, was that before or after women's department? You know, I'm not good at dates. So I want to say, I think it must have been going on. Yes, I think I was president of women of JVS, or I was something at JVS when I was campaign chair. I remember doing them both at the same time. Okay. So I think it was around the same time. And I was well, president of, of JVS for three terms 
So that might have been six years, I'm That's not a long sure. Time. Yeah. So traditionally, women's department had programs aimed at education. They had two two tracks, education and and also and campaign. Right. Do you remember working more on either either side? Did you come up through education or did you I, I I'm guessing that I came up through campaign. Yeah. And then when you're president, of course, you're more into the education, and that's where you learn that. Right, right. Yeah. So um, what really inspired you to even aspire to be president of women's? Well, I mean, I pretty much, if I'm going to do something, enjoy leadership. And I used to be terrified of speaking, and I came to love it. <coughs> I love speaking now, and I used to be so scared I'd be shaking like a leaf and couldn't even eat my dinner if I had to stand up and say my own name. Um, but I really, I enjoy leadership, so that's probably why. And um, I don't think, I don't think I actually aspired to any job, but I think, you know, everybody doesn't want to do it, and so if you're a person that wants to do it, and you seem to be okay doing it. Um, that's kind of how I saw whatever I did because I got very involved in general campaign too. General, I mean, general federation stuff I did almost. Later, everything. right? Later and at the same time. I think it all happened together. So, okay, can you describe some of the duties that you remember as campaign chair? Well, as women's department. Yes, women's we're gonna, this is for women. Well, right. first of all, I want to say that I worked with Sally Krugel in my days there, and Sandra Jaffa mm -hmm. were the main two that, that I worked with. Um, well, I mean, I think you had to inspire people. You had to show people that you would be willing to do the solicitations, which I don't like any better than probably most people. I like to speak, but I don't like to solicit particularly. You have to make the meetings fun and interesting and um, try to inspire people by letting them know how very important each dollar is that we raise and where it goes. Um, I just enjoyed it. I liked it. I didn't find it well, overly Well, can you, can you talk about the role of women in fundraising and women in um, the, the whole the federation, the whole thing? Yeah, I was saying to Robbie Turman, I wish I had ever unearthed my um, Butzel Award speech because it was all about women. Marianne um, Friedman told me the purpose of my speech was to inspire, and I decided to inspire young women. Uh, and the Women's Division Department Philanthropy is it. I mean, it's the incubator, the innovator. It's where the ideas came out of. It was our job. And we made friends and colleagues, and we enjoyed being there. It was, it was our work, and we showed up. Four or five times a week, I think, for different kinds of meetings, whether you were president or not. And so many of the ideas, and I, I sort of was struggling with that a little bit, but so many of the ideas that came out of women's division and department went, found their way up to the general campaign because it just was that way. And um, it was a very collegial, and it still is. Our, our staff worked very hard, but we worked very hard. We did. We were on the ground, we and we were in it up to our eyeballs doing it. And, and we, it was we a had good fun. It was it was fun. a good learning place for us. Oh, Lear yes. it, it was a good training place. It was a good. It was like right. It helped us for all of the things that we did and were going to be and doing. And so many women went went out and got amazing jobs because of the leadership and the work. Absolutely. What they had learned. Okay, so during the time that you were um, campaign chair and president, women's division became women's department. Right. Do you remember um, why that happened and, and how you felt about it at the time? Yeah, I remember that Sandra Jaffa, I think, was kind of strong for it. She was our, our um, exact professional. Right. And so she went around the country to different meetings, and that was definitely a trend. And um, I'm trying to think what the other divisions were, but like Help me. The other divisions in well, the there general was like, was like a, a mercantile PAC. division. No, but also the PASC was a division. The campaign divisions. I mean, the division did not have the gravitas. Right. That it was felt that the women, half the population, had, and that we were, if you took a scale and put down all the divisions, that we were 
much more, frankly, important and to be respected as than a division. And so there were other departments, which I'm, I'm, I'm not sure about the departments and divisions, but departments were definitely elevated over divisions. Right. And so our, our, our um, professional and probably the, the national women's were already probably the women's department, and they is, just felt that it wasn't a... Is this the time when we became the women's education and campaign no. department? Was it a long thing? It was, was first, I think, the women's department, and okay. that sounded kind of not, not descriptive enough. And then okay. at some point, we became the women's campaign and education department. Okay. And on the scale of how the Federation presented itself is like a family tree. A department, that's part of it, was, was, was elevated, yeah. Right. yeah. Okay, so um, what were some of the challenges that you faced as campaign chair? Well, I think in those days we were losing families, as we've been doing many of the years, so, so new gifts was a very important, very important thing. Um, getting people involved. Okay, getting women involved somewhere in when when Susie reminded me, I think when Penny was president and I was campaign chair, but for many years they had been pushing Detroit to get the Lion of Judah pin, which had started in Miami Beach, I don't know how many years before, maybe ten. Our community, most of us, many of us, were very much opposed to the pin. And I was personally opposed to the pin. It was a, a new concept for me, and I was opposed to the idea of Jewish women giving at a certain level, which was $5,000, which was a great deal of money in those days, and that the symbol of that was becoming a large gold pin. And I, was, I just didn't like the concept at all. I just thought it was not where I wanted to go. But it was proving to be very effective, and they were from right from the top down at National, were really pushing all the communities to do this. And I remember, I remember Jane being against it, I was being against it, probably Penny was being against it, I'm not sure. But anyway, finally, 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 we decided we had to be enough of team players as long as it was working. And I was really annoyed, but I was campaign chair. And so I had to go out and I had to, to push it. And I would say, even in those days, you know, even if you don't think like me, that this is the best symbol, but it hopefully it will inspire women and it will become a positive sign. And when people will see women wearing it in an airport or in a, another city or somewhere, it will become a little bond. Um, and so it still isn't my favorite concept, but it works and it's it certainly is very entrenched in the women's well, world now. I think you brought something up. They they had envisioned that women would wear it outside of their campaign, like wear it, in the air, wear it in the airport or wear it, which I'm not sure that exactly happened. Well, I think in certain communities it has, and yeah. they had also envisioned that every time you gave a gift or raised your gift, you put another diamond or another ruby in. Detroit kind of drew the line on that one, and we never went for that. No. But, you know, for, I've seen a lot of women... Probably not younger ones, but older ones. So where did the Lion of Judah conference come in? Were you? Yeah, I was at the first one. Yeah, we we were at the first yeah. one, but I don't think I don't remember it wasn't who was the president. Award yet. No, uh, um, the Lion of Judah conference came when the national, it's all strictly national, right, right. wanted to do a big important meeting, and that evolved into the Kipnis Wilson Award, yes. which was sheer genius mm -hmm. because I still continue to go to those conferences which always proved to be fabulous but I never really want to go till I get there because there's always a friend of mine receiving the Kipnis Wilson whatever right, honor. Right. Um, I was the first one to get it in Detroit I and know. they taught, called me the little kipper I was uh, and Susie I, got it. Yeah, well uh, yeah but yeah. I was involved with you getting oh, it. Oh okay I'm sure. And the, and, and the thing about the uh, lion conference and the lion pin people strove to it was a good marketing tool because yes, people definitely 
you know, and husbands would see the pin and they'd right. say, Absolutely. I want my wife to have the Absolutely. pin. So no, no, no. It's turned out to be a very positive thing, even though it still isn't my favorite thing, but it's it's still a, it's a good thing. And uh, I was um, I was somewhere today and I was wearing it and somebody admired it and said, what a beautiful pin that is. And I said, well, what is it? And I said, well, that's um, the Lion of Judah pin and you receive that for giving a large commitment to the Jewish Federation. And as I left there, she said, what a beautiful pin and what a beautiful idea. So there you so go. So I guess it works. Yeah. So were you affected at all by transitions in staff and, and leadership changes when you were, do you um, remember that? I loved, well, I loved the staff. I mean, I got very friendly with so many of the staff. Laura Linder has become a very good friend of mine. She was our, our um, exec when I was campaign chair for the general campaign. Um, and I just have a lot of respect for the staff. It's changed. It's more staff driven, I understand. But I don't know if it's that much more staff driven in women's philanthropy. I don't know. Probably. I don't know. But so um, how would you rank women's philanthropy among your other philanthropic activities? Because you've done okay, a lot. So it was my number one, mm -hmm. other than the general. And I did a lot in the a lot. I did a lot in the um, general campaign. I was campaign chair. And then I was president of JVS. Um, those were it. I mean, I did a lot of other things, but those were my main, my main things. Now I'm very involved in the Israel Guide Dog Center for the Blind. But uh, Federation was always it for me. So do you feel women solicit differently than men? Yeah, I think well, most women, I think, are more empathetic compassionate, interested in listening. Not, it's not in our nature to push people around, I don't think, which might be good, might not be good, but I just think that's in the nature of a woman. So do you feel that um, Federation in general has valued women's, our women's department? Not enough, not enough. Because we, and when my day, when I, we were here, and I don't know now, but we had zero budget. I remember trying to get a speaker that Chicago had and saying, how did you get that speaker? And they go, oh, we just go to Nassiter and we just tell them who we want and they just get them for us and they don't, and we were just really struggling. So I don't know how it is now, but like in everything else in life, I think women are undervalued. I don't know now here in Federation, we've had plenty of women in high office. Um, you'd have to talk to some of the women who are are here now, but if it were my guess, I would guess that, I mean, we're the best. The women's department so is the best. So let's talk about yeah. that. What are some of the reasons, and I agree with you, that women's department is the best? Well, first of all, it's forever because you make your best friends, seriously make your best friends through here, most of my best friends, and you work together, and you're really trying to be innovative. And we have fun. We have real fun. I mean, one of the, my fondest moments was doing with Diane Klein the archival exhibit for I forget which anniversary and the show we did. And I mean, it was a very all-encompassing all life for the women. And the women are bright and brave and willing to offer all sorts of suggestions and really willing to go the whole way. I think we, I think the women's, the women's is the real, the real well, driving force. Talk about force. leadership training of, that women and do. And when I first came in, we used to do these marvelous seminars. And that's kind of how most of us got into women's department. We'd get on a bus once a week for maybe six, eight weeks, I don't remember. And we would go visit every single agency in the community. So we were literate and knowledgeable. We would have meetings where we would, would learn to speak. Um, where we would learn briefing, about Israel, briefing meetings, briefing meetings, um, icebreakers. We just, we and just. Really you were involved um, with the Midwest, and I was a regional chair for the Midwest, which we region, don't have anymore. Which we don't so have what anymore. was that? That was a breakdown between our community, the regional, which was in Chicago usually, and the national. Mm -hmm. And I was never on the national board till way later. Um, I really. I wasn't, and uh, but I was regional chair, and we used to come with our region mm -hmm. and get all sorts of ideas from each other. And that's the thing about women's department; we're always looking for ideas. And of course, so is federation. We, 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 you know, we we network with each other. And I I still think the women's 
sent out more info and more ideas up to the general um, than, than any other force. So why do you think it's important for women to have a separate campaign? Oh, it's just, I mean, it's the old saw of plus dollars. It's definitely plus dollars, number one. Number two, especially I would think in today's world where women stand for themselves for everything, not only that, but many women were the impetus for their husbands and got their husbands, who in those days, you know, had the big box to give the big gifts, mm -hmm. but inspirational to get involved in federation. And I think that, I think it's very important. I think you have to respect a family who wants to give as a family. Um, and then just even, everyone gives as a family. So, I, and then sort of convince them to carve out something. And not today, because so many women are working and heck with it, it's equal. But um, I just think it's important we're our own person and we want to be our own person and everything else. And even back in the day, those of us at Federation wanted to be our own people. We weren't just an appendage of our husband. Right. So, very important. So, um, why is How much do we raise these days? Do you even know? We raise a lot. Well, we were raising, in women's department, um, close to $5 million, yes. which yeah. is a very... Yeah. And very I remember when we hit the one million, I think. Yeah, so, yeah. right, right. So why is philanthropy important to you? Oh, well, philanthropy is the most important thing to me. Um, it always was. Now that I have more money than I ever did before, it's even more important to me because it's such a thrill to be able to give it. You know, when I was younger, I loved it because you, you're, it's just, if you're a good person, you just want to help somebody and you want to inspire other people. Um, and, and it's, I can remember once saying, you know, it's not quite as much fun for people that aren't, don't have a whole lot of money but it's wonderful in your heart, even if it's not as much fun. Right. When you have a lot of money, I have a relatively a lot of money, not compared to a lot of other people, but I, a relative lot of money. There's nothing more thrilling to me than being able to help and do and, and, and make a difference. And so to me, and doing too. That's the other thing about women's department. We did as well as gave. Right. The men never had a chance. I, right. I sort of feel sorry for them on that one, but we did as well. That was as part big. of the fun, wasn't it? That was the fun. Yeah. You know what else, Linda, that we could talk about mm. is um, your involvement with Israel. Okay, so from the time I was a little kid, and I said that my dad and mom, right. they had a home in Israel. My father was the, the national campaign chair. His passion was always Israel, Israel, Israel. So I always loved it. I went for the first time when Tom and I were. Um, in, well, we went in 1968, mm -hmm. and we went on a young leadership mission, and that was it. I fell in love, and I loved it. I think I've been there 45 times. I want to say Tom's been there a third of that many times. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, I was very involved in Partnership 2000, now Partnership Together, and I have real friends in Israel, not family and not, you know, real friends. And... Um, now I, go to, now I go to Israel with my girlfriend, Tova Dorfman, and we just play and we go, to the, uh, we go to different causes and see where Tom and I are giving money in Israel because we have a fund here at Federation called the Global, what's it called? Unmet Global Needs um, Centennial Fund, and it only goes to Israel and overseas. So I'm always looking, trying to be a little bit innovative myself after I'm gone. The, Federation can do what they want to do. Okay. Well, do you think your children, are your children, did they pick up your charitableness? Do they, do they? They are now. They are they, now. They always were loving Israel. They went to Israel a couple, two, three times when they were little. Mm -hmm. And now we have a family foundation and separate from this global one, Right. It's a family foundation and my children and me on Tom, on the board, and others, there always have to be an equal amount of people in the community who we know. And we have these family meetings where my kids get a vote and they read and they do and they give the money along with us. And we're having another one um, on, Ju on July 22nd, mm -hmm. our second one. So now they're very, very, very involved in it. Um, and um, 
No, it's fantastic. And they are at all now also involved in the Israel Guide Dog Center for the Blind. That's so they've great. each had a fundraiser at their house, yeah. So, And they're involved in their kids' schools. Kids' schools, and my one daughter is very involved in things spiritual. So they're, they're all involved in their, in their community and their schools. Not so, federation, though. They're not involved they're not in federation. Involved. No. Okay. So what are your hopes for women's philanthropy in the future? Mm. You know, I'm a little out of it right now. So I would hope, not mentally out of it, but out of the stream, <laughs> no, <you're right. laughs> since I go to Florida in the winter. Yeah. But um, I, I would just hope that they would continue to thrive and strive and find their own place. I would hope they would always want to find their own place and swim upstream if it becomes more like only families want to give together mm -hmm. to accept that, but try to make a still separation, even if the family is quote unquote giving together, carve the gift out. It's, it's as I said, all families give together. I mean, mm -hmm. there's no question. Right. So um, I don't know that I've thought that much about that. Okay. I, I hope the Well, is there will... anything else that we haven't covered that before we end that you'd like to add? Because you've been very, very I, I good. would add that many federations are falling apart uh, and ours isn't. And that's because of our leadership and because of the nature of our community in Detroit. I, so my, my hope for the Federation would be that they, that they grow with the times and are willing to change with the times. Because I know certain things are kind of getting stale and people feel like that. Um, I'm not sure what or how or why, but just to keep our minds open and look at what's going on in the world and the country and see if certain old things we're doing are losing people and not inspiring people. Um, you know, the issue of the umbrella or the not umbrella, I'm an umbrella person, and I hope that we can always find a way to make ourselves modern and important and relevant within the umbrella concept, because I think you can get into very sexy charities and, and forget the ones that really need us. And so, it, and it's a hard sell for some people, particularly young people. So I would hope we can figure out a way to be modern and all encompassing and doing the right thing for the right people. Great. Thank you, Linda.